Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> that was very enthusiastic. I much appreciated it. Um, so I hope all of you who have pets already have the means by which you will help them get through the 4th of July holiday. <laughs> so everyone's been really enjoying all the free neighbors' fireworks, right? At all hours of the day and night, even when you can't see anything, let's set it off in the middle of the day. Great. So much, so much for you guys. Um, seeing as how it is the 4th of July tomorrow, the office will be closed tomorrow, and then Nicole's out of the office on Tuesday. So if you need the brains of the office, call Wednesday. And then, um, I don't know who all has had a chance to read the outreach, but there was some really, really great news that was in there. So, uh, Mark Wyatt, who was a member of this church about 50 or so years ago, he was very generous in remembering the church in his estate, and the church received money sufficient to pay off the consolidation loan. Oh, yay! So, so the check was written, the check was cashed, <laughs> make sure of that, and um, so that is really wonderful news that we wanted to share because we know that that's kind of been hanging over our heads for a long time and we've been slowly eating at it. Um, but grateful for everyone who over the years has helped pay down the principal to where we can do something like this. And uh, also grateful for the people that have remembered the, um, that remember the church, you know, we had this endowment that we used to help pay down things. So we were able to use that over the years to help pay this down. So all of that generosity over the years has now led to debt freeness. So um, I wrote in the outreach, um, this is sort of the jubilee for the church. The jubilee in the Bible was a period, scholars debate whether it was every 49 years or every 50 years. The Bible is not consistent on this account, just so you know. And that sort of Sabbath of Sabbaths, this jubilee was when all debts were forgiven in Israel. And ancestral homelands were returned to their original owners. It was sort of this great renewal, restart, refresh. So we get to have that in our own way. So just want to be very grateful for uh, Mark Wyatt thinking of us. He just said, here, have, have this. How wonderful so for all of us here to celebrate this are there any other um, announcements for the good of the people thank you all for being here on the fourth of july weekend <laughs> thank you so let us enter into this time of worship with some sacred silence
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, and now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, these you all thy servant, all desires know, and from you must be desired. Blessed is our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. From the second book of Kings. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because for him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, 
He tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a messenger to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots, and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Aban and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm for today is Psalm 30. We'll read it together. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have bowed my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cry out to you, and you restore me to hell. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing to the Lord, the servants of his. Give you thanks for the remembrance of his holiness. For his wrath endures with the twinkling of God, his favor for a lifetime. We may may spend the night. The joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with the Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Declare your faithfulness. Hear our Lord and have mercy now on me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my failing into answering. You have put up my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. 
So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whatever, whenever you have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised. Not only that, they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. 
remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet, know this, the kingdom of God is coming near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventeen returned with joy, saying, Lord, in the name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven with a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord. Lord. Praise. Take no supplies, no purse, no sandals. Don't greet anyone on the road. How unfriendly. Show up at a house, eat and drink what they offer you, wish them peace. And if the people in the town don't want to listen to you, do make a big show of wiping off that dust from your sandals and protest and go on. Seems a little unfriendly, a little austere. Unplanned, unorganized, pretty impossible. And yet, we haven't done much better on the flip side. When evangelists went out with colonists and merchants, it didn't really end well for the native people they encountered. And when church wide committees sit and plan evangelism campaigns with all sorts of data and maps, it ends up getting stuck in cycles of bureaucracy. And then we bring our hands and think, well, we can't do evangelism. We don't have the resources for it. But the truth is, we do. What do we have? We have our own prayerful experience of Jesus to share with one another. I'm not talking about some amazing, tremendous spiritual experience. I'm not talking about an eye-opening, earth-shattering, mystical experience. I'm not talking about anything that you haven't already experienced. The fact that you are here in this service, in this community, this morning, that there's something is drawing you to God. It might be a lifetime of discipleship and church community that is instilled in your spirit. This idea that worship is an important part of your life. It might be a series of questions in your spirit that nudge you to keep coming, hungry for scripture and knowledge, and maybe occasionally a good song. It might be the desire to sing out praise to God in community. It may be that you have a desire to help others by prayer, by service, or you want a community of belonging, of inclusion, where you can simply be yourself and others can be themselves, and we all can grow together. All of these things are good, you know. God is drawing you closer by all these things. So don't you imagine that other people are looking for those things too? That God is drawing others closer, and all that needs to happen now is that you invite others to share. 
Last week, a group of LGBT high schoolers in recent rounds arranged a panel of religious leaders, including me, to talk about inclusion and justice. They've seen so many Christians saying some really terrible things about gays, and especially transgender people lately. And intuitively, these high schoolers knew that that doesn't quite line up with what they've heard about God, what they know about God. It was a holy conversation. They asked some deep questions, and they shared some deep hurt from their own experience of religion. The fact that these teenagers were willing to open up about their experiences to strangers, people they did not know, meant that they deeply want that spiritual community, spiritual affirmation, that connection to God. Those teenagers were hungry for community. They're hungry for God. They want to know about a God who loves them as they are. It also invites them to grow and to learn, to make the world a better place. They honestly do have a lot of respect for tradition and ritual, but just it needs to mean something more than just because we've always done it that way. They want to belong in a community where they can be themselves, fully themselves. Awkward, imperfect, confused, silly, weird, able to make mistakes and still be loved. They don't want to have to pretend to be anything that they're not. As I say those things, you might be thinking, I want that too. We all belong to this. We've longed for roots in these confusing times. We long for a loving community. We long for a better vision of tomorrow. Those teenagers and we. We all long for the kingdom of God. We long for a connection to Jesus. Not Jesus the angry judge. Not Jesus the guy who conveniently dislikes everyone I also dislike. Not that kind of Jesus. They want, and we want, real Jesus. But turning back to our gospel reading for today, Jesus, in his evangelism, sends his disciples out without him. Sure, he's going to go to those towns eventually. But these evangelists need to go out first by themselves. These 70 evangelists sent out two by two go out to share the good news ahead of Jesus. Already we see how Jesus' evangelism really works. It isn't really about the going out to tell people about Jesus. It's bringing people into the community of Jesus. If we're going to meet Jesus, if we're going to follow Jesus, it's not just Jesus alone, but we need to get with his friends. It's not just Jesus, it's Jesus and the fellowship of his friends. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we tend to think of geography. We think of boundaries on a map. But the kingdom of God is that fellowship of Jesus. It's the people. It's the power of God in our midst. When we're stuck in the mindset that we don't have enough, we forget that the power of the Holy Spirit is already with us. Evangelism isn't about having the flashiest graphics or the easiest service to get through. It's about you, you, sharing the love of Christ with others, sharing your own hunger for God, sharing your own desire for prayer and spirituality and community. That's it. It's sharing these things with people out in the community who are hungry for that love of Christ. They can see that you are hungry too, and they will join you. It's sharing these things with with new friends who are courageous enough to step foot in the door of a church on Sunday morning. It's sharing these things with one another, with our longtime church friends. It's sharing, giving, receiving that love of Christ, that desire for the life of Christ with one another. We don't need a whole lot to do that. And we don't need to get bogged down in, what if it doesn't work? Sharing the love of Christ in thought, 
in word and deed is never a failure. It's a work of the kingdom of God. So I guess it looks like Jesus did know about evangelism after all. Amen. 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 Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Jesus. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and understood. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Additional intercession for yours, not the Lord. Let us pray for the church and the world. That the people of God in all the world may, may worship in spirit and in truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Michael, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Joseph, the bishop of Idaho, the leaders of our diocese and the church throughout the world may have the wisdom and grace to carry out the ministries given to them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That this parish and all saints, its clergy, wardens, vestry, and leaders may have the assistance of the Holy Spirit in all that they do for our common life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the nations and leaders of the earth may seek after the ways that make for justice and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That war and violence may cease in all the world, and that all people may have safety, shelter, and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the whole creation may be strengthened, safeguarded, and healed that it may reflect the glory of its creator. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the people and ministries of the diocese may have what they need to fulfill our common mission. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all those people of our hearts, especially Donna, Cheryl, Bill and Barbara, Mark and Kim, Kathy, Catherine, Mike and Chuck, Brent, Susan, Linda, the Sykes family, Karen and Daryl, Pam, the Harris family, Gerald, the Ritholler family, Marilyn, 
along with those we name silently or loud. May have the healing presence of Christ in their lives, now and always. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the worship, excuse me, that the worship and hospitality ministries of all saints, such, such as Eucharistic ministers, altar guild, camera operators, ushers, coffee hour hosts, and all others, may lead us in loving God and loving one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That our prayer. Let us commend the world to which Christ showed the way to the mercy and protection of God. Amen. Amen. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all beings in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and will come to repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may do all in the world and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Are there any celebrations or blessings that you 